Ave Maria, grazie per le donne, non stai con Benedicto, tu mi hai e Benedicto su tu sventi e stui Jesus. Santa Maria, Madre Dei, orfano e nobis peccatoribus, non vi terrare mutis nostre. Amen. In nome di Padre, e Figli e Spiritus Santi. Amen. Carissimi, beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass as we said on this, the feast of Saint Anthony, the Great of Egypt, confessor and abbot, known as the father of monasticism. Born on the 12th of January, 251 AD. And you may recall that uh, we had a reference, we made reference to St. Anthony just two days ago uh, on the feast of St. Paul the First Hermit, who of course he visited uh, on the uh, day literally before uh, St. Paul died and was gifted uh, and gifted a uh, cloak that had been gifted to him by the great St. Athanasius of Alexandria. St. Anthony then, uh, born into a, a wealthy family, uh, but uh, by the age of 18 uh, or 20, his uh, parents had died and left all the fortune to himself and his little sister. On the way to uh, church and in church, uh, St. Anthony uh, dwelt upon uh, the gospel, particularly from St. Matthew, chapter 19, verse 21. And indeed, during the Mass that he attended, uh, that uh, verse occurred in the Gospel of that day. You may recall it as the moment when uh, the young rich man asks Jesus how uh, he has been doing everything, uh, but how can he receive eternal life? And our Lord tells him, sell all that you have, give up away all your possessions, and come and follow me, which uh, St. Anthony takes literally, uh, is so inspired that uh, when he returns home, uh, he uh, sells off uh, the land of his family to the neighbours, and with the proceeds he saves some uh, as a dowry or as a, uh, uh, yes, indeed as a dowry for his, his younger sister, uh, and uh, the rest he gives away to the poor, uh, and then takes himself off uh, into the desert. There he would be for uh, 13 years in this first tranche of existence, dwelling in a cave uh, several miles outside the city, there alone fasting and praying. And indeed he would continue that existence uh, his first dwelling place, this cave, for 13 years. Then he moves to uh, the remains of a Roman fort uh, and uh, does another 20 odd years there before then uh, moving and founding uh, uh, another place where he is joined uh, by disciples. Uh, and then again he takes himself off to a place now known as St. Anthony's Monastery uh, in the desert in Egypt. Uh, and to which, of course, uh, people, uh, monks, have been dwelling for over thousands of years, uh, over 1,500 years since. Indeed, there is uh, a famous monk there. It's a, uh, a Coptic monastery. Uh, somebody asked the other day, what does Coptic mean? Coptic simply means uh, Egyptian. Uh, and uh, the uh, monastery of St. Anthony in the desert, uh, and there are still uh, monks living there, and there's a famous hermit, uh, Zacharias L. Anthony, or Zachary of Anthony, uh, an Australian convert uh, to Orthodoxy and then to uh, uh, the monastic and eremitical life, uh, who featured uh, in a program um, uh, on the television, a BBC uh, series, uh, the Reverend Peter, somebody or other, uh, who's a vicar in Sussex, uh, Extreme Pilgrim, Extreme Pilgrim. Uh, you can find it on YouTube. Uh, look for Extreme Pilgrim uh, Egypt uh, and uh, he went and spent some time uh, with this Father Anthony uh, who as it were uh, and by many actually is, is considered a kind of contemporary personification of St. Anthony of the Desert uh, and he lives in a cave um, a couple of miles walk uh, outside uh, the monastery uh, in the mountains uh, and this uh, uh, vicar went and uh, spent some time with him and then spent some time, uh, uh, spent a week uh, uh, living uh, that existence. 
uh, and very interesting uh, insights and spiritual insights uh, occur in that uh, he records in his documentary. So it's well worth uh, watching. Uh, so uh, St. Anthony uh, there uh, deliberately seeking uh, to be, uh, to deliberately seeking to uh, be with God, indeed deliberately seeking uh, to literally uh, take to heart uh, the words of Christ uh, concerning discipleship. In 338, uh, he, as it were, left the, uh, the wilderness briefly uh, and entered Alexandria. Perhaps it was here uh, that he received the, the cloak as a gift uh, from St. Athanasius, uh, with whom he helped to uh, defend uh, the heresy of Arius. Uh, then he returned uh, to his monastery. We know in 341 uh, that he, uh, was, he received a dream, a, a vision of St. Paul, uh, and off he went uh, to visit uh, St. Paul, the first hermit. That was in 341. And then, of course, he himself passed away in 356 AD. So you just do the math there, 251 to 356, 105 years old. You may recall that St. Paul the hermit uh, lived from 226, 227 to uh, uh, 341, in 113. So clearly, uh, the eremitical life, the life of a hermit or an anchorite, uh, is, is good uh, for, for the health uh, of one's body as well as, we might say, of one's soul. Now, he's attributed as being the father of monasticism. This really is a title that comes to him as a Western appreciation. Uh, we seem to have a slightly greater uh, uh, appreciation for St. Anthony, perhaps because of St. Benedict of Nursia, who was so inspired by him. Of course, St. Benedict uh, was 200 years later after Anthony, uh, but of course, who has uh, made the biggest impression uh, in the uh, Latin West uh, concerning monasticism and monastic spirituality, but inspired by St. Anthony. In the East, um, he's not quite so uh, uh, revered. Um, we might remember that St. Anthony, though he is called uh, uh, the first monk or the father of monks, uh, he clearly wasn't. Uh, you may recall that uh, he was prompted to visit St. Paul the first hermit because he thought himself perhaps the greatest uh, and holiest and the first of the hermits. And God sent him the dream and said, no, 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 there is one other. Uh, there is St. Paul. Go and visit him and learn from him. Uh, and we know that uh, already by this time, indeed from the first century, uh, individuals uh, and even uh, groups had taken themselves off out of the world uh, to live in remote places uh, there to be with God and to take the uh, uh, evangelical councils as we now call them that uh, poverty, chastity and obedience uh, to take them literally and apply themselves to their lives in order uh, in pursuit of, of sanctification and this is perhaps uh, what we ought to remember uh, about this early form of uh, monasticism or this early form of uh, eremitical life, uh, whereas we tend to think uh, of uh, religious, of monks and nuns, uh, as having given up. So, for example, they take on chastity. We think that they have given up relationships. Uh, they make the vow of poverty. We think that they have given up material things, uh, uh, they take a vow of obedience and we think that they have uh, surrendered their own will. But actually, uh, that is the wrong way uh, to think of uh, the religious life. It is the wrong way to think of the attitude and the approach uh, that those drawn to the religious life have. It's, it's not so much uh, a matter of giving up, uh, but embracing. But embracing poverty, embracing chastity, embracing obedience. It is, of course, a form of self-denial, it is a form of submission, of subjugation to the pursuit and the discernment and the application of the will of God and of uh, uh, a literary uh, uh, response, as it were, to the words of Jesus. Uh, but uh, we shouldn't think of them really, uh, and religious don't think of themselves as giving up these things, but rather they think of themselves as embracing these other things. So it's, a, it's a, a change in mindset, as it were, from perhaps the way we generally think in the world. 
uh, where of course people want to have possessions, where people want to have relations, intimate relations, where people uh, want to be uh, uh, free. You know, uh, the, the words or the term or the concept of obedience to most people's minds uh, means the, the giving up their free will. Whereas for a religious, of course, uh, it's recognizing that their, their will and their free will is, is really only God's will. And so it's about embracing God's will for their lives uh, with their will, matching their will, as it were, to God's will. Um, And of course there is a great deal that we ourselves who live in the world, there is a great deal that we can take from such a mentality and from, from such uh, an attitude. Because all of us as Christians really should be approaching the Christian life and the pursuit of sanctification in a similar way. It should be a loving response in love to God's love that we seek to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Jesus. It's all about love, but it's all about that love which of course we know as sacrificial love, as caritas, as charity. It's that love which is not love of itself, but love that gives itself, love that surrenders itself, love that submits itself, love that is selfless, love that cannot help but be shared, cannot help but be expressed, cannot help but be lived. In many ways, perhaps, uh, of course, we, we generally think of uh, those who uh, embrace the religious life as perhaps being uh, heroic uh, in terms of Christian discipleship. We think, we think of them as heroes, that they've taken themselves out, uh, taken themselves out of the world uh, and away from the world uh, to focus on God. Well, that's largely because many, many of us have a kind of Platonistic appreciation uh, of, of faith and a religion of spirituality. We think of it all as spiritual up here and God up here and earth and practical things down here. And we forget that our faith is incarnational. It's about finding the balance between the two, the balance between spiritual and physical. That is the ideal, the perfection that we should be striving for uh, as Christians. So that in actually in some ways to uh, achieve in the world that sense of balance is just as heroic uh, as uh, uh, anybody taking themselves out of the world uh, to follow uh, Christ and to find that balance in their lives. Uh, somebody who can deal with everything that ordinary life uh, throws up at us, somebody who can uh, deal with uh, the responsibility of, of work, of bills, of, uh, um, uh, of, of work, uh, of a living, of a family, supporting a family, growing a, a family, of parenting, uh, of living with another uh, as a spouse, um, uh, anybody who can do all of that and at the same time find that uh, perfection of equilibrium, that perfection of, of, of balance uh, between spirit and physical is a hero, certainly in my estimation, I would say in anybody's estimation, uh, uh, anybody who has an appreciation for what the Christian life is about. We might say, actually, it's, quite, it's easier to take yourself out of the world and lock yourself in a cave or a monastery uh, to be alone and to just to focus on God. We might say that, and some of us perhaps think that, but actually we will be wrong. Because in many ways, as the life of St. Anthony, written by Athanasius, uh, demonstrates to us, taking those who take themselves out of the world, as it were, those who try to distance themselves from the world, indeed try to distance themselves, as it were, from temptation and distraction, in many ways, endure a greater trial because they become the focus then of the demons. They become the focus then of the great tempter who seeks and does uh, torment them. Uh, we know that St. Anthony in his life described by Athanasius has uh, great trials uh, and temptations and, and battles uh, with uh, the devil. 
Uh, we know that uh, others uh, who apply themselves to uh, the uh, ascetic life uh, often uh, endure such trials uh, when they are uh, forcibly, almost some, even visibly attacked by the devil. For example, in the life of St. Anthony, uh, various wild beasts uh, would appear to him um, and uh, as, as if they were to, you know, going to, to tear him or, or cut him to pieces. Uh, and he would uh, advocate uh, the, making the sign of the cross. Uh, he would make the sign of the cross and these uh, phantoms would just disappear and dissipate. Uh, but there's also another occasion uh, when in the solit uh, solitude of, of the, the old Roman fort uh, in which he had holed himself up for 20 years, uh, it is said that uh, one occasion uh, he was severely uh, beaten. Uh, indeed, that this was towards the end of that 20, at the end of that 20 year period, uh, he called for help uh, and the local villagers uh, uh, came and, and helped him to, to, to get, leave the fort and he was covered in bruises uh, where the devil uh, had beaten him up, literally. You may remember St. John Vianney, of course, much later in the 19th century, uh, also uh, used to endure uh, such trials and tribulations from the devil. Though, of course, he was living in the world, but living such an aesthetic life. Uh, wake for 20 hours, sleep for four, uh, eating only potatoes, um, and hearing confessions for 16 hours a day. Um, so it's clear that the devil, of course, uh, will focus on uh, and uh, anyone who he sees is, is deliberately and particularly uh, growing uh, in holiness and in closeness uh, with God. I like to think in some ways that, uh, and I'm not sure that um, uh, my brothers and sisters in the uh, monastic life would like to think of it this way, but I sometimes think of it this way, that uh, while the, 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 they distract the devil from the rest of us, the rest of us who are uh, striving in the world to proclaim the gospel and to uh, f find that perfection of balance between uh, the spiritual and the, and the physical life, uh, uh, while uh, the devil is distracted uh, by uh, those who are pursuing holiness in the desert or uh, in the monasteries. Um, and of course, the other thing is, is, is they pray. Uh, as we said the other day, the hermits, uh, those who live the Chenobitic life, the Chenobitic life is, means monks and nuns, so those who live a hermetical existence but in community, um, uh, they of course pray, and they pray for the rest of us. So as much as they may be fighting off demons and everything themselves, uh, when well, the devil is trying to distract them from their pursuit, their particular focus of uh, pursuit of holiness and personal sanctification, at the same time, uh, they are also praying for us. Because they recognise too that those of us who are in the world, who are striving for that perfection between uh, spirit and, and physical, have our own kinds of difficulties. We have our own kinds of temptations and distractions those things that try to take us away or, or that um, uh, help, you know, that, those things that distract us from our goal, from our intention. So we need not necessarily think that those who take themselves out of the world uh, to pursue the religious life, uh, we need not think necessarily that they are greater than us or better than us. It's simply, as we said the other day, horses for courses, Martha or Mary, uh, both are equal vocations, both are equal expressions of Christian discipleship, both at heart have the pursuit of holiness. Both at heart are about the sanctification of one's life. Remember that monks and nuns, though they have taken themselves out of the world, though they, live, they may live in what we think as a rarefied spiritual environment, uh, nonetheless, they're still physical beings. They still have to feed and clothe and wash themselves they still have to maintain the buildings that they live in. Uh, they still have to generate an income uh, to support their life. Uh, so uh, what they do, we also can do ourselves in the world. Because we too, of course, eat, sleep, drink, work, live, uh, have to have to provide shelter, etc. So, uh, and it was St. Anthony, of course, 
200 years before St. Benedict, uh, who recognised uh, the importance uh, of this life of balance of prayer and work, and indeed how uh, one can be working and praying at the same time. One can be praying and worshipping God, and that itself is a form of, we might say, labour. And then one can be labouring, doing ordinary daily tasks, the things that need to be done uh, to support life. But at the same time, we can pray doing those. And as we will reflect in tonight's, com in tonight's conference um, uh, in, uh, about how do we love God, we will reflect too then uh, about ways in which we can sanctify our day, sanctify our lives, uh, sanctify the ordinary things we do in life. Remember that monks and nuns are physical beings like ourselves. Uh, and in a monastery, a monastery is a house, a convent is a house, and it has to be provided for uh, re, uh, maintenance and economy and everything else, just the same as, as us who live in the world. What it's all about, however, is the manifestation of love for God. It's about uh, the focus of our lives uh, toward God and seeking to make ourselves uh, worthy and ready for heaven. God, of course, who is all holy, uh, we then, of course, should desire to make ourselves holy, to be worthy to be with him for eternity. And we do this by following, of course, his precepts, by following his commandments. So we've spoken before about those of us who live in the world, uh, about us adopting uh, an approach and an attitude that mirrors and reflects the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity and obedience. We All of us should be obedient to the word of God. We should, all of us should be obedient to his commandments, to the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, to the uh, summary of the law, the two great commandments. Uh, we who live in the world, we are subject to those. We should be obedient uh, to God. We should be obedient too to God's will. We should be discerning God's will in our everyday lives. We may not have as much time as we might like uh, to pray and to meditate and discern God's will, but we should make the time because God should be first and foremost in our hearts and in our minds. Just as we make time uh, when we're courting, just as we make time for our hobbies, just as we make time uh, for other things, we should make time for God. Indeed, making time for God should be the first thing we should think about in our day. The first thing we should think about in our day. Not that cursory five minutes, or well, not even five minutes probably. Not that cursory upon waking, thank you God for another day, and then go and get showered and changed. Not that uh, 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 brief moment perhaps of, of thanksgiving in conversation with someone uh, and say, oh, thank God for that. Not that uh, five minutes before sleep, uh, uh, thanking God, you know, thank God for today. Uh, sorry if I did, or, you know, sorry if I didn't do this or that, or I should have done this or that. I'm sorry about that, and go to sleep. That's not how we, as Christians who live in the world, should be approaching our our life uh, as Christians. Rather, we should each of us be setting aside some time of every day, preferably with the Scriptures to uh, read them, to study them, to inwardly digest them, to think about them, to pray about them, and apply them to our lives. It must surely be possible, my brothers and sisters, for everybody to find at least half an hour, if not an hour, at least half an hour. And in fact, breaking it down to half an hour, you might be able to, to make up an hour with two half-hour segments of your day. And if you can't make that time, then you need to think perhaps, well, hold on, what is the primary focus of my life then? What is so important uh, that I can't make time for God? And if perhaps you have dependence, if perhaps you have a particularly uh, challenging, caring uh, 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 responsibilities, so for very young children perhaps, uh, or um, an elderly relative that you look after or whatever, include them then in your time with God. Make them a focus of your charity for God, just as you are being charitable in looking after them. 
that however and in whatever way you ought, my brothers and sisters, each and every one of us ought to be able to find time for God in any given day. Preferably we should have the same time. It's better to have a, a, a regular schedule of these things. But we should be able to find and make the time. And if we can't, then as I say, then something's wrong. Then something else is first and foremost in our hearts and minds. Then something else is more important in our life than God. If we cannot make time for him, proper time. As we said uh, yesterday, Jesus was not joking. Jesus was deadly serious when he said that we should prefer no one Father, mother, husband, wife, brother, sister, children should prefer no one in our affections to God. No one should take priority over God. God must take priority over all. And as I said before, when God is first, when God is put first, when God is at the centre of one's life, when God is at the centre of one's family, everything else generally works out because everything is in the right way. So, St Anthony then, for, the, for, for us, of course, we appreciate uh, his witness and, his, and we give thanks uh, for his example in the pursuit of the spiritual life. We certainly give thanks for all those he has inspired vocations in since, who have given their lives to God, who have uh, uh, embraced uh, uh, charity who have embraced sacrificial love for God and for neighbour but we too who might think ourselves less spiritual than monks or nuns we too should be should take uh, some of his lessons to heart for and apply them in our own lives because all of us are in the are in the business of pursuing heaven all of us are about the work of sanctification of purification in our lives all of us are about living in love and in union with god first and foremost and with our neighbor with each other so we give thanks for the life of saint anthony and we apply his lessons to our lives that we too may like him grow in love with god through his father son and Holy Ghost. Amen.